Um, we left off on Thursday with Hrothgar's giving his, what's collectively kind of been called homily, or Hrothgar's sermon. Um, <coughs> scholars who don't want to use religious terminology uh, we'll just call it Hrothgar's speech or Hrothgar's message. But it really is a homily or a sermon. Okay? And I think we left off with around line 1735 or so. So he begins, let me to back up for very briefly, around 1709, talks about Haramode. Tells us what happened to Haramode, why Haramode was betrayed into his enemies by his people, etc., etc. And in 1724, Hrothgar begins telling, for lack of a better phrase or, or way of talking about it, he begins to tell a story about a, a person who becomes a king, so to speak. He says, it's a wonder to say how mighty God in his great spirit a lot's wisdom, land, and lordship to mankind. He has control of everything. Meaning, it's a marvel to say how God chooses you, you know, to get wisdom, lordship, mankind, land, etc. God controls everything. At times, he permits the thoughts of a man in a mighty race to move in the lights. Now, notice what that is telling us. He permits. He allows the thoughts of the kind of person who has wisdom, land, lordship over mankind to do what? To move into lights, give them to hold in his homeland, sweet joys of earth, etc. So this person becomes a powerful ruler. Cool. He gets a great kingdom. So that top of page 108, line 1733, this individual cannot imagine an end to it. An end to what? Kingship, his rule, his power, his authority over humanity, all of that kind of stuff. Okay? So, step back for a moment. Why would the person not be able to imagine an end to that? How's life going for this person? <laughs> yeah. Elon Musk, good. I mean, real good, okay? Everything's going great for him. And then he adds that half line in his folly, in his foolishness, he can't imagine an end to what is going on. If he can't imagine an end, then what does not what does he not expect? To die. Okay, to die? What else? Well, maybe, don't be so final. <laughs> Before that, and I'm, and I'm, you're right, but change. He doesn't expect things to ever change. He expects, well, I'm up here top of the world. Guess what? I'm going to be up here top of the world forever. He dwells in plenty. In no way plague him. Illness or old age, meaning he's still, let's say, relatively young. You guys, from my perspective, you're all young. Relatively young, from your perspective, you know, you might be able to look forward a few years and imagine being in your 30s as being relatively young, or 40s possibly. You know, I look, 50s is relatively young. So he's not sick, he's not old, evil thoughts don't darken his spirit. We're not told what evil thoughts mean, what kind of evil thoughts, but these are thoughts that darken his spirit, depress him, bring him down, okay? Nor any strife or sword, nor does he have any enemies, or, so that's one possibility, or he has enemies, but what? Louder? He beats them all, or they're afraid to challenge him. Okay? Uh, 
1960s, 1970s, mutual assured destruction. You try and do something and we're going to nuke you to kingdom come, so to speak. Okay? This is how he is at this point. Everything's just fine. Hate shows itself, but all the world turns to his will. That is, he does have enemies out there, but we're not going to touch you. We know the enemies know this guy has all the power, so to speak, so they're not going to challenge him. He knows nothing worse. So again, describe this person, this at this point, rulers, king's life. Not a problem in the world. At last. It doesn't say at the last. It doesn't say at the end. It just says at last. What does that last mean? At last, his portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. So, at last means what? It's another word. One word for that. Okay, finally implies more end. Eventually. <laughs> Something's going to happen, right? His portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. What, what's that mean, his portion of pride? It means everyone has a portion of pride. You know, you do well on exam. You should feel proud about that. You do well on a paper. You do well in some, it, you know, you should, you should feel pride in that. His grows and flourishes. What does it mean when something flourishes? Oh, it does really well. It's strong and it's healthy and it's vibrant. But when you're talking about pride and it's strong and it's healthy and it's vibrant, it's what? It's Donald Trump level. I don't care your politics. doesn't matter. It's bordering on divine, arrogant level, right? While the guardian sleeps. The soul's shepherd. So the pride grows and flourishes while whatever the soul's shepherd is sleeps. And you've got a gloss down at the bottom. Uh, I thought there was. Yeah. The slayer, sin, or vice, the soul's guardian is reason, conscience, or prudence. Anglo-Saxons did, did not have a concept or a term for conscience. The closest they get is Saulus Warde, what gets termed the soul's guardian, the soul's protector, the soul's warden. Okay? Conscience, it does what? It falls asleep. Why did it fall asleep? What do people get when everything's just going? Great. I mean, not a problem in the world. Complacent. Complacent. What does that mean? You just kind of like cruising, right? You, you hit your life, you hit the cruise control of life. So you don't have to keep your foot on the pedal. And you just sail on along. And the conscience does what? I'm not troubled by anything. Nobody's challenging me. I don't have any problems in life. The devil has been destroyed, you know, so to speak. You just... That sleep is too sound, bound with cares, the slayer too close, who, sinful and wicked, shoots from his bow. Okay? Who is... The slayer. What is the slayer? Your gloss tells you the slayer is sin or vice. We don't know that. Nothing in the poem actually suggests that. 
There is a slayer, the word bane is used earlier in the poem. The slayer of souls okay, is referred to. That is everywhere understood to be Satan or the devil or evil, if you want. Here, it's just the slayer. Sick, sinful and wicked shoots from his bow. <clears throat> then he, the person who life's been great for, is struck in his heart under his helmet with a bitter dart. Who wears a helmet over his heart? Where do you wear a helmet? Up here. Why? Because that term is specific to the head. You can wear a helm over your chest. Helm just means protector. Okay? Some scholars, I'm included in this, think this passage is an allusion to St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 6 where he tells the Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God, where he describes a person in armor. Helmet of faith, breastplate of righteousness. Okay, And what is a breastplate for? What's it protect? The chest, the heart, the lungs, etc. What is that, in that passage, what is that supposed to do? To put out the fiery darts of the evil one. There he is struck in his heart under his helmet with a bitter dirt. The word that gets translated bitter can also be translated fiery. Like in the book of Ephesians. Several of us, many, read this as an allusion to Paul's passage in Ephesians. And so if the arrow strikes under the helm, under the protector, what does that mean? It gets in. Why the heart and not the mind? Because it creates an infection. It courses through the body with each beating of the heart. He knows no defense. Why not? He, the person who's been stricken, doesn't know any defense. Why? Why? Because everything's been... The strange, dark demands of evil spirits. That is, he doesn't know any defense against those. What are the strange, dark demands of evil spirits? Doesn't literally mean, I don't think. I could be wrong. Does it literally mean evil spirits, like demons? It means thoughts, promptings, urges. Here are the strange dark demands that the evil spirits, the dart, puts into him. What he has long held seems too little. Angry. He's had everything. Now what's he want? More. <laughs> Think Amazon. It has everything, right? And now it's moving into healthcare, pharmaceutical goods. What's going to be next? Air, <laughs> you know, water. Just my own two cents there. Angry and greedy. He gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts and his final destiny he neglects and forgets since God, ruler of glories, has given him a portion of honors. So notice what Hrothgar says, this imaginary character, stops doing. What came before this passage? His description of Haramod. What did Haramod not do? He didn't dispense treasure. This guy gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts. Kind of like Haramod. What else? His final destiny. What's his final destiny? Not a video game. Death. Right? We all die. 
He does what? He neglects and forgets. How do you neglect your death? It's kind of a good question. It's easy to forget, right? Especially when you're your age. It's a lot easier. Because you think, I'm 20, 22, whatever. I've got my whole life ahead of me. I don't. Most of my life's behind me. I look, you know, 20 years, maybe 25. I don't want 25. 20 would be fine. But most of it's back there. He forgets what? He's, he's been way up here all of his life. And what's he thinking? I'm not going to die. I've got everything going for me. That's how he neglects and forgets it. But neglect implies an action. Forget, forget isn't an action, right? Neglecting implies what? Not preparing. Beowulf says more than once, what is best for the man doomed to die? What should you do? Go fight. For what purpose? To get glory and fame. That is the best thing for the one doomed to die. Why? Because then people will remember you. And they'll talk about you. And they'll tell stories about you that we inflict on students, you know, a thousand years later. This. Well, if you don't go fight, you don't get that glory. You don't get the stories about you. And we're told, notice at the end of that passage, Hrothgar reminds his audience. Who is his primary audience? It's one person. Beowulf. God, ruler of glories, has given him a portion of honors. God gave him, what's portion mean? The word that's used there is the same word, if I remember correctly. I'm not going to look it up because we don't have time. It's the same word that we use to deal out cards. He dealt him a portion of what? Honors. What happens with this guy's portion? It grows and flourishes just like the pride. And he thinks nothing can touch me. Pretty much when you start thinking nothing can touch me, that's when fate knocks your legs out from under you. Okay. In the end, it finally comes about, there's your death reference, that the lone life dwelling, the body, literally that is leech homa, life dwelling, the home of the life, okay, does what? Starts to decay and falls. When does that generally start? At 20? I read a thing the other, day, the other day about some 19-year-old who has Alzheimer's. It's not called Youngheimer's for a reason. Alt means old in German. Old homers. It's the old home sickness where you lose your mind, lose your faculties, lose your marbles, so to speak. That's not supposed to happen at your age. It happens when? As you get older and older and older, you, you know, body becomes frail, joints, all that kind of stuff. And falls fated to die. Everyone dies. But this guy, when he's way up here, forgets about it. Another follows him who doles out his riches without regret. Who's the one who follows him? It's his son. His son does what? With all the treasure, this person now started the hoard. Opens up the vault and says, come and get it. Remember the prologue? Shield Shevin had a son, Baal, Beowulf, and that son did what? He dispensed his father's treasure as a man ought to do. Why? So that in his old age he will have warriors who will stand by him. This guy didn't read that passage. This guy hadn't received that message. Okay? Meaning the guy who died. But the son does dis distribute treasure. He heeds no terror. That is, the young one just 
opens it up. Defend yourself from wickedness, dear Beowulf, best of men. Best of men, and he's just been talking about what? The guy who was, in his day, best of men. So defend yourself against Beowulf, because you're kind of like the guy who I'm just talking about. And choose better. What does it mean, choose better? Better is a comparative adjective. Better than, he doesn't give us the than. He says choose better. What's he really mean? More wisely. And then he defines that. Eternal counsel. Eternal advice. That is, advice or counsel that will aid you in eternity. Totally foreign to the Germanic mindset. This is a Christian idea. Or at the very least, a monotheistic idea. Okay? Choose God, as it were. Care not for pride. The whole thing is a homily, a sermon, an exhortation, a warning against pride. Okay? You will not find that in any other kind of pagan, excuse me, or native mythological Germanic text. Because they all say, more pride the better. Why? Because pride gets you reputation. It gets you glory. Pride spurs you on to greatness. The glory of your might is but a little while. What has Beowulf just done? Last two days? One each day. Grindel, Grindel's mother. He's just rid Hrothgar's kingdom of the Grindel problem. And he's saying, yeah, 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 you're strong now. It ain't gonna last. Again, we don't know how old Beowulf is. Glory of your might is but a little while, but soon, too soon, it will be that sickness or the sword will shatter your strength, or the grip of fire, or the surging flood, or the cut of a sword, notice sword's now been mentioned twice, or the flight of a spear, or terrible old age, or the light of your eyes will fail and flicker out. Another reference to terrible old age. Notice the two things Hrothgar emphasizes by mentioning them twice. Sword and old age. Th those are the most likely ways Beowulf's going to die. He does allude to fire. He does mention fire, which is kind of interesting because Beowulf's going to die from a dragon. In one fell swoop, death, O oh warrior, will overwhelm you. And overwhelm kind of implies, kind of, it'll be quick. You're not expecting it. Thus. What does thus imply? Or possibly therefore. The same word can be translated therefore. Thus a hundred half years I held the ring names. And that's where we're told how long Hrothgar was king before Grindel came. Because he says, kept them safe from war from many tribes throughout this middle earth, from spears, so that I consider none under the expanse of heaven my enemy. So what did he mean by thus? Some Beowulf scholars, not, is, I don't think this is a consensus opinion. Some of us think Hrothgar is talking about himself. That whole little, imagine a man, and now he's put a name to him. Thus I. I was this guy, Beowulf. I had everything. God gave me a little bit of pride. It bloomed. And I mentally, morally fell asleep. And then the slayer, the, the fiend came, attacked me. I wanted more. He builds Herod. Look, 
turnabout came in my homeland, grief after gladness, when Grindel came. What might he be suggesting is the reason for Grendel's coming. His own pride. Okay, so read that in the larger context of the poem. When Grendel comes, when Beowulf's there, what are we told Grendel bore? God's ire, God's anger. Did Grendel carry that anger in him? Was God pissed at Grendel? Or does Grendel bring God's anger to Hrothgar? Like, got to take you down a few notches, Hrothgar. You're getting a little big for your britches. I think it's the latter. I could be wrong. That is not a necessarily a majority opinion, let's say. There are some who hold it. So, he says, when Grindel became my invader, the ancient adversary, for that persecution, I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. I sorrowed, I suffered. Thanks be to the creator, the eternal Lord, that I have lived long enough to see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. What's his point? I had everything going great. Turnabout came. Reversal. Change. There's a reason why I think the poet gives us those lines 175 to 188 that Tolkien believes are interpolated, are added by a later Christian monk, where the poet talks about what did they do? Hrothgar's men, they remembered hell. Why? Because they're heathens. Okay? And they sought out the soul slayer. They prayed to him that he would give them help. And they thrust themselves into the fire's embrace why? Because they never expected any change. They never expected any comfort. That is, once the bad stuff happened, they thought from that point on, it's always going to be bad stuff. When the good stuff happened, they thought what? It's always going to be good. Things will never change after this. In other words, they're kind of flighty. And once it's kind of airheaded, they're pretty simplistic people. Rothgar is telling Beowulf, Learn from my example. Let me be your exemplum. An exemplum is an image a preacher uses to teach a moral message. It's the story the teacher, the preacher, uses to get a moral across. Um, if we were doing the partner's tale in Chaucer, we're not, we're doing Wife of Bath's Tale. The partner tells a story about these men who go looking for death. J.K. Rowling rips it off in the Harry Potter stuff. It becomes the tales of Beetle the Bard. And in the story, the three men go looking for death and they find treasure. Anybody know how it ends? They all kill each other. Why? Because treasure divided by one is a lot more than treasure divided by three. Okay? And the point is... The root of all evil is the love of money, greed, avarice, okay? So he tells the story to get the moral across. Hrothgar has just told the story. What's the moral? Beware pride, okay? Fast forward, the dragon comes. I mean, fast forward a lot. The dragon comes. What does Beowulf immediately think we get told? He had done something wrong. He had offended God. And he has, we're told, dire, dark thoughts. We're not told what those dire, dark thoughts are. We're not told that Beowulf goes, oh, I forgot Hrothgar's message. I've been full of pride because I lived 50 years and had total peace and happiness. We're not told that at all. Okay? Go to your seat, enjoy the feast, honored in battle, between us, oh, treasure, okay? And so Beowulf, glad-hearted, that is, Hrothgar made him feel good. How about you? I'm probably kind of wondering, what 
What do you mean? Why are you warning me about pride? Wouldn't it be nice to know Beowulf's age? Because I think this homily, if Beowulf's 20 years old, it means a hell of a lot more than if Beowulf's in his late 40s or 50s. Okay? We're going to be told later in the poem. We won't get to it because 300 lines before my previous class. We're going to be told Beowulf, later in the poem, Beowulf says that he was sent to live with his grandfather when he was seven years old. Okay? Raised by his grandfather. Hrothgar said, when Beowulf is first mentioned to him, I knew him being but a boy. When is that? It's not when he was living with his grandfather. So sometime between zero and seven. And Hrothgar said, he knew him then when? Well, he gave refuge to Edgethel when he was newly in his kingship. He ruled for 50 years. Newly in his kingship? Could be first year, could be fifth year. But if Beowulf's five years old, when Hrothgar begins reigning, and Hrothgar reigns for 50 years, or maybe Beowulf is born in the first five years, let's say that. So Beowulf's 45 at the end of Hrothgar's 50-year reign. Then Grendel comes. So Beowulf is now 57 when he shows up. If he's 57 and being preached to about pride, guess what? Probably too late. <laughs> Habits set in, you know. But if he's 20, probably not too late. But stay with that age for a moment. If he's 57, when he comes, bare minimum, how old is he when he fights the dragon? Because he's going to rule for 50 years. It makes him 107. We don't know how much time passes between Beowulf right here at Hrothgar's Hall and when he becomes king. It could be a year. It could be 10 years. It could be 20 years. It could be 30 years. So he could be anywhere from 108 to 138 when he fights the dragon. Totally different Beowulf. Yes? So, but does that really matter since the poet didn't, like, really talk about it much? Is he, like, concerned about that? I don't know. I mean, this is, I don't I mean the poet doesn't specify Beowulf's age. And, and that could be, your question could be the reason why literally no one, I've read the scholarship, no one has ever written anything about Beowulf's age. And I think it's partially because the poet doesn't specify Beowulf's age. I think it's important because it, if nothing else, it emphasizes one aspect about Beowulf's character that a lot of scholars don't want to look at. He is totally other. He's not from around these parts, in other words. His very name, the fact that, I erased it in my earlier class, the fact that his very name begins with B and not a vowel tells us he's different than everybody else. Look at all these other names. Hrethel, I, I talked about this the other day, H, 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 O, 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 okay, um, wa, wa, O, vowel, vowel, all vowels alliterate with other vowels, Germanic fashion, you name your son, that son's name alliterates with yours. They do not alliterate. To me, that is a, a visual and verbal clue. Beowulf is different than everybody else in the poem. And that might have then have an influence or a bearing on how we understand the character of Beowulf. Because we're going to find out he's not a king like everybody else is a king. 
He doesn't do something, for example, that Shield Sheving does. Or that Hrothgar does. He doesn't expand his kingdom. He's going to tell us with his dying words. He doesn't expand his kingdom. He doesn't go out and seek battles. And he doesn't enter in something modern politicians ought to learn something about. He doesn't enter into alliances with others. And part of that is probably because he's Beowulf. He doesn't need alliances. He kills monsters for a living. Everybody else out there, they know. Don't mess with him. Okay? But it's, it's almost like Beowulf is presenting. The character in the poem is presenting a different way of being a king. That, that the dramatic fashion, the dramatic ethical code, duty to one's lord, duty to one's kin, duty to avenge one's lord and kin, doesn't work. What do we see? Every instance of feud in the poem. How's it end? Death and destruction. Ultimately, death and destruction, both sides. For, I mean, the reason all this is up here is, assuming we were to get to this section of the poem, which is around line 2400 or so. Hold on. So, Beowulf speaks. He says, we want to go home. Hrothgar gives him a bunch of treasure. Wealthyall gives him a bunch of treasure. They go home, okay? Just before they do, line 1855, Hrothgar says to Beowulf, you have brought about that between our peoples, the Gaetish nation and the Spear Danes, there shall be peace and strife shall rest, the malicious deeds they endured before, as long as I shall rule this wide realm. So what has Hrothgar just told us was the state of affairs between the land of the Danes, or Shildings, and the land of the Geats before Beowulf came. They were in hostility. Beowulf solved it. Notice, this is the, I think, it's the only instance where a feud is resolved. We're not told what caused the feud, the feud. And notice what Beowulf did to end the feud, the conflict. He didn't kill any Danes. Who did he kill? He killed the outside party that was harming the Danes. And Beowulf, in other words, Beowulf did something he did not need to do at all. He's going to go back to, to Helak in the Geats in just a moment. And Helak's going to tell us, man, I really fretted. I really had problems with you going off and doing that. I told you, let Hrothgar face his own problems. And if Beowulf had followed Helak's advice, what would have happened? Grendel would have kept coming. And the Danes and the Geats would be in what state of affairs? Seemingly perpetually open hostility. See, this is why the Coast Guard ran down and said, what the hell are you doing? This is our land. And when they, when they tell them, oh yeah, we're men of Helax. You know, I got a, a bunch of men back here. They're hiding. I, I need to determine who you are and what you're doing. Okay, so Beowulf and his men, yes? I have a question, and it's not fully formed, so I don't know if it's going to make sense. That's okay, that's, I never make sense, so go ahead. Why does it matter that he's presenting like a different way of being a king? In the end, it just seems like he doesn't see any of you life, and he still gives them to Jane. Because the last thing he asked for is to see his goal that he won. Yep. So why does it, how, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I get what you're getting. I see what you're getting at. After Beowulf is bit by the dragon, okay, he's bit on the neck. Dragon's venom, because the dragon has poisoned his venom, goes through his body and he shortly dies thereafter, dies shortly thereafter. And Beowulf prays to God, thanks him for a variety of things, but he also tells Helac, uh, tells Wheelof, Bring me some of the treasure. Let me see what I've won. 
But he doesn't see, let me what I've won for myself. He says, let me see what I've won for the geats. What I've bought for them. How does he buy it? With his own life. He gives his life for the treasure. Because he thinks the treasure will do what for his people? It will help them. Okay? Unbeknownst to Beowulf, what's the problem with the treasure? The poet tells us. Anybody know? It's cursed. Okay? And the curse says anyone who touches it, unless they are allowed to by God, anyone who touches it will be cursed. And so some scholars have read that. Um, for lack of a better phrase, I'm going to call them the Christian allegorists. That is, they read Beowulf as an allegory, as a Christian allegory. And Beowulf is not a Christian. Bear in mind, Beowulf is not Christian. They don't read Beowulf as being emblematic or a sign or representative or symbolic of Jesus by any means. They pretty much all say, you know, Beowulf is damned. He's going to go to hell and eat. Roasted Winnie's alongside him. Grindle, so to speak. Okay? Um, they suggest because the gold is cursed, Beowulf is cursed also. And not only Beowulf, but Wheelof is cursed, and all the men of the Geats who help pull the treasure out and put it on Beowulf's funeral pyre also get cursed. I don't think that's the case at all. Okay? I think the poet is suggesting Beowulf is the one chosen or approved by God to have the treasure, to bring the treasure out. Okay? But we're going to see what happens to that treasure is the same thing that happened to the treasure a thousand years previously. What am I talking about? Skip the homecoming, okay? Skip for a moment the homecoming, where Beowulf goes back to the land of the Geats. He meets with Helak. He gives Helak and Hig all the treasure. He actually gives the neck ring that Welthael gave him to Hig, which Helak then wears on his fishing raid, okay? So they get welcomed in. I'm going to come back to the question in a moment. And that's when Helak says, you know, I really worried about you. I thought this was a stupid move, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Um, Beowulf's going to tell a story about Hrothgar's daughter, who we never heard about before, but he has a daughter. How she's going to marry this guy, Ingeld, son of Froda, king of the Heathabards. In the story Beowulf tells about Freywaru, that's Hrothgar's daughter, and Ingeld, is essentially the same story we saw recited after Beowulf killed Grindel. It's the Finsburg fragment, just in the Heathabar's land. She goes off to live with her husband, she brings her retinue, and war breaks out. Why? Because one of the men, one of her men, is strutting around wearing the armor of a dead Heathabard warrior. And an old grizzled Heathabard warrior is going to tell the son of the dead Heathabard warrior, look at that. He's wearing your daddy's armor. That's your daddy's coat of mail. I fought with your daddy. I saw your daddy wear that. That's your daddy's sword. You're going to love it, kid. Get him. Go get him. And he does that several times. And the son finally, what? Has dark, bitter thoughts. And he goes and slaughters the guy. Strife is renewed. The feud is enjoined. And Beowulf says there will be no peace from that. Okay? Then we get told that's on round just before and just after the beginning of Fit 29. Then Beowulf relates the battle with Grindel and Grindel's mother. There's not a lot to talk about there. We're going to skip all of that. Fit 31 begins with Beowulf giving all the treasure to Helak and Hid. Why? Thane-Lord relationship. 
Beowulf looks at the treasure that he won in that battle as he was fighting a battle for Helak. And therefore, all the treasure he won is actually Helak's. He's showing proper devotion to his Lord. In Helak, we're going to be told, lines 21, 80 and following, Helak then gives some of the treasure to Beowulf. But he adds to it. He gives Beowulf his father Grendel's sword. He puts it in Beowulf's lap. This would be like what today? It'd be like King Charles. It's hard for me to say that. I still think Queen Elizabeth. It'd be like King Charles taking the crown jewels out of the Tower of London and bestowing them to a captain or a general in the military and saying, this is yours. And then, beyond that, giving that individual a large portion of the land that belongs to the crown. Not the largest portion, because Helak is still the largest landowner, we're we're going to be told. Then, line 2200. Then it came to pass, amid the crash of battle in later days, after Helak lay dead, then in later days. How many later days? Later days, that kind of passage, that kind of phrase, That usually implies years. Years have passed. And now he lacks dead. Okay? The Frisian raid. This is not the next reference to the Frisian raid. It's going to come later. And for Hardred, the swords of battle held deadly slaughter under the shield wall. That is, he lacks son is now dead too. When the battle shelvings sought him out. Battle shelvings? That's the Swedes. So we're told the Swedes attack Hardred. Cool. Well, not for Hardred, but. That the kingdom came into Beowulf's hands. 92208. He held it well for 50 winters. 2209. That is, boom. We had in less than nine, less than 10 lines, Beowulf's just gotten back to Helak and then. 50 plus years go by, and Beowulf's now king. And what happens? Some poor slob, that's my translation for what is often described either as a slave or captive, robs a dragon. This is the source for J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Okay? He robs a dragon. He takes a cup from the dragon's hoard. For what purpose? Needs a cup? No. He's going to use that cup to buy his freedom or pay his debt, one of the two. The manuscript on that page is damaged. It's not damaged from the fire. It's damaged because the person who is writing in it at this point takes that leaf of the manuscript. It's it's probably bound by this point. He takes that leaf and scrapes everything off the vellum, cowhide, okay? Scrapes all the writing off and writes something new on it. This is the guy who's written the rest of the manuscript. What? Kevin Kiernan, author I mentioned before, in his book Beowulf and the Beowulf Manuscript, argues that at this point, What we really see is the poem that we know as Beowulf comes into existence for the first time. In other words, this is the author doing this. That the only poem that we know of as Beowulf, it didn't exist prior to this scraping off and having this passage written here. What might have existed before then was Beowulf in his fight with the Grindelkin, the Grindel kind, in Beowulf in the fight with the dragon. Kinnan's argument is, prior to the manuscript that we have, those two stories 
had never been joined together. And so there were stories about Beowulf in his youth and a story about Beowulf in his old age, but nothing linking them. And this is what we have. Because it's right here in the manuscript that the two are joined together. Okay? So, the guy steals the cup, pisses off the dragon. Dragons are like glorified accountants. They know every piece of their hoard. Dragon's been asleep, we're going to be told shortly. He takes the cup, and the poet gives us a lengthy digression. Okay? The digression is called... Delay of the last survivor. Okay. We've already seen that motif before, right? The wanderer is what? He's the last of his people. This guy is going to be the last of his people. And we're told, inside the dragon horde, when the thief goes in and takes his cup, he sees 2235, the rich legacy of a noble race, precious treasures. And then the poet just says, in earlier times, death had seized them all, all who had still survived. A mournful century, except for one, a mournful century. So all this guy's people are dead. He's got all their treasure, and there's a barrow. We're told it's newly constructed. The barrel, a mound with an opening, a doorway that goes into it. These things survive, I mentioned it before, in England, in the continent, Europe, France, etc. You have round barrows, and you have also what are called long barrows. There's a couple that are like 100 feet long by 50 feet wide. And you can go in them for almost the full 100 feet. I mean, you can go inside several of these, okay? And what's the guy do? He takes all the treasure of his people and he puts it inside this barrel and he says these words. So this is the poet recounting, the poet telling the entire tale of Beowulf then gives us these words of this one guy who lived a long time before Beowulf. I'll give you the long time before in just a moment. And so he says what? Hold now, O thou earth, for heroes cannot the wealth of men. And we can stop there. Because what has he just said? What's going to happen to the wealth of men? It's going to go back into the ground. Why? Heroes cannot hold it. Why? They're all dead. J.R.R. Tolkien, in the essay, Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics, says, at one point in that essay, I've mentioned this before, all of Anglo-Saxon literature is ultimately about one theme. The death of man and all his works. And you have it right there. All his works for this tribe, all their wealth. Lo, from you long ago, those good ones first obtained it. And notice what's going to happen to it. It's going to go back into the ground. What good did the wealth do those good ones, ultimately, not a lick of good. Okay, Death and war, awful deadly harm, has swept away all of my people. And so he goes on and he gives us a description that almost matches the description by the wanderer of what happened to his people. And the Ubisuit motif. Where now are, where are now, where are... Lines 22, 50 and following. So he says, 22, 62. Harp joy have I none, no happy song. Nor does the well-schooled hawk soar high through the hall. Why? There is no hall. His hall is what? What is this really? Modern terminology. It's a grave. It's a tomb. Savage butchery has sent forth many of the race of men. I think that's Lytotes. Not all Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon scholars do. So when he says it sent forth many of the race of men, 
How many? All. Savage butchery? War. What's the race of men he's talking about? The warrior heroic society. This is what it gets you. Six feet. So grieving, he mourned his sorrow alone after all. His days went by, and he died. Okay? Raymond Tripp, the reason I have this name up here, Anglo-Saxon scholar, highly regarded by a lot of Anglo-Saxon scholars, Mitchell and Robinson, in their edition of Beowulf, they thank him, and they make reference to a couple of his articles. He wrote an entire book, a lengthy book, Four, three or four hundred pages at least um, about this passage. And he argues that this last survivor who goes into this barrow after he puts all the treasure in and lays down on it. What are we told here? So grieving, he mourned his sorrow alone after all, unhappy sped both days and nights until the flood of death broke upon his heart. He argues that this guy dies of a broken heart. Okay? But then he wakes up. I said he died. How do you wake up from death? Not Jesus. He's not resurrected. He wakes up, but not as a man. He wakes up as the dragon. Nobody, nobody, accepts this thesis. Nobody. They think it's utterly crazy. He has several reasons for why he makes this argument about why it works and such. Part of it is a reference to an Old Norse tale about Fafnir the dragon, one of the only, in fact, I think he is the only named dragon in Germanic literature. Fafnir wasn't always a dragon. Fafnir originally was, memory is very vague on this one, foggy, was either a dwarf or a man who found a dragon's horde, went in and said, mine, fell asleep on it, and woke up transformed into Fafnir. C.S. Lewis, if you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, takes the same image in the book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and that becomes Eustace. Eustace, the snotty, whiny little boy, who I like to call useless, falls asleep on a dragon's horn, and he wakes up as a dragon, and he has to be de-dragoned. He has to lose his dragonish characteristic. Well, Tripp argues the dragon is the last survivor. But, Paul goes on, it is in a dragon's nature, it is his nature, to find a hoard in the earth where, ancient proud, he guards heathen gold, though it does him no good. Okay. 300 years, that threat to the people held in the ground his great treachery. That threat to the people, that's the dragon. So the dragon finds the treasure, or if you're trip. The dragon becomes and then sleeps for 300 years. Anybody know what the motto of Hogwarts is in J.K. Rowling's universe? Close, really close. Never tickle a sleeping dragon. Why? Because they wake up. This is really important. Okay. Why does the dragon wake up? Because the guy steals a cup. What does the dragon do when it wakes up? It comes outside. It looks for the tracks of the thief. And it executes a pattern of destruction. I used the example in my first class. The dragon is not like a Roomba. You know, robotic vacuum cleaner. That goes this way, and then this way, and then that way, and then back here. It looks totally random. It's not. There's an algorithm. The dragon does what? The dragon comes out and then starts to circle. And the circle gets ever larger. And while it's circling, it's, you know, blowing flames, torching everything. Okay? And it does that to a certain distance until the diameter is destroyed outside the barrel. 
included in that destroyed land was Beowulf's Hall. Okay? But notice, after the dragon does the destroying, we're told, it goes back to its hall, its barrow. He had surrounded the people, 2321, of that region with fire, flames, and cinders. He took shelter in his barrow, his walls in warfare. That is, he thinks he is safe now inside his hall, his barrow, and because of his warfare, his power. But we're told by the poet, the news is brought to Beowulf because apparently he's not in his hall when it's destroyed. And that's where we're told Beowulf thinks, I offended God. 23-29. The wise one believed he had bitterly offended the ruler of all, the eternal Lord, against the old law. We don't know what against the old law means. What old law? Don't offend God? <laughs> we don't. It's very enigmatic. What does Beowulf think he violated? We don't know. But what we do know is compare this with Hrothgar's reaction to Grindel. Hrothgar does what? He sits down and mourns. Beowulf immediately assumes effect my countryside being torched must have a cause. What was the cause? I mean, it's not the dragon. The dragon's the effect. What did I do to cause this? What does Hrothgar seemingly never do? He never wonders, why did Grindel come? Notice he says more than once, hey man, God's able to do anything. God could stop it tomorrow if he wanted to. But Hrothgar never takes that next step. Why didn't he stop it? Okay. It's interesting. Pause for a second. It's interesting if you go back to Hrothgar's homily and everything that happened prior to that. The guy who's got everything going great, kind of like the United States, at one point in history. Right, if you guys don't remember this. 1989. Anybody know what happened? Late 88? Late 88, December of 88. Berlin Wall fell. What did the Berlin Wall symbolize? East and West. Warsaw Pact. NATO. No. Soviet Union and its ally satellite states, and the United States and its allies, okay? Because of the division of Berlin into two. Well, the Berlin Wall fell two years later, year and a half later, Soviet Union fell apart, okay? George Bush, the first one, said, you know, it is a right opportunity, it is time for a new world order kind of based on the UN Charter and all that kind of stuff. We're going to bring, you know, peace among the East and West and all that kind of stuff. Germany reunified a couple of years after that, 93, I think it was. Bill Clinton gets elected in 1992. He gets elected partially on the promise of what was called the peace dividend. That is, no Cold War. United States and the Soviet Union are no longer, it was said, pointing our nuclear missiles at each other. They were, they still are, okay? But we don't need to maintain this level of defense. And it was claimed by some, the United States and the West, and it's still claimed, won. We won, Ru Soviet Union, not Russia, Soviet Union and its ilk all lost. Therefore, we could turn our swords back, back into plowshares, okay? Clinton was kind of elected on that promise. A famous historian, a guy named Francis Fukuyama, wrote a, 
an essay called The End of History. And by that he, mean, he meant the end of the war against communism, because communism is just going to you know, whittle away to nothing by this point. Right? What happened in February 1993? Anybody know? February 26th, to be exact. We just had the 30th anniversary. It was the first World Trade Center bombing. How many of you knew there was a first World Trade Center bombing? Guys drove a truck under the World Trade Center in the basement. Truck was loaded with explosives. It blew, blew a hole 200 by 100 feet in diameter over seven stories deep into the ground. Okay, Whole building of one and two World Trade Two Towers shook. They didn't collapse, okay? That happened February. Clinton wasn't even two months into his office or into his tenure as president, okay? Few years after that, 1996, Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia were bombed. 1998, U.S. Embassy in Tanzania was bombed. October of 2000, the USS Cole was bombed off the coast of Yemen. What does all that mean? We couldn't rely on the two, you know, oceans as protecting us. We couldn't rely on NATO, the idea of NATO, and the end of history protecting us. In other words, we came to this conclusion, ah, the United States has won, NATO has won, it's gonna be peace and prosperity and love and happiness, and not even a month into Clinton's tenure, boom, boom, boom. I'm not knocking Clinton. Clinton had no idea. It wasn't his fault, okay? Just boom, 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 one after the other. Part of Rothgar's point, you reach this thing and you think, hey, nothing's gonna change. It's all gonna be great going on from here. And then reversal change comes. Beowulf thought, seemingly, everything's great. Why? He had 50 years of peace. We're going to be told in his dying speech, I alluded to this, he doesn't seek out warfare. How is that different from the first king in the book, in the poem, poem who is described as Thackel's gold kitty? Shield Sheving does what to his neighbors? Deprives them of their mead benches. He expands his kingdom. Beowulf doesn't. Okay? Beowulf doesn't enter into treaties alliances with others. Why? He doesn't need to. He's Beowulf. He kills monsters, you know, for pleasure, seemingly. Nobody attacks him. So if nobody attacks him, what kind of military training do his warriors have? War games? Not the same. You got to get that adrenaline going. You got to figure out battlefield tactics. How? on the battlefield, okay? His men don't have any of that training. So, what does Beowulf do? He doesn't do what Hrothgar did. He doesn't sit down, moan, and complain. He wants revenge. Notice, he's troubled by dark thoughts. What does he not let those dark thoughts do to him? That seemingly, Hrothgar did. Don't paralyze him. Hrothgar became paralyzed. He just sat there moaning and complained for 12 years. Beowulf orders his men, build me a shield. What kind of shield? A wooden shield covered with ox hide? Nope. A metal shield. And a lot of scholars think this is an indication that this poet probably knew Homer's Iliad. And if the poet did know Homer's Iliad, didn't know it in Anglo-Saxon, knew it in the original Greek, because the description of the building of the shield is very similar to, this, to, the, to the description of the shield, Achilles' shield, in the Iliad. Achilles has a shield made, they go through the same process. Okay? So that happens. Then we get told, lines, uh, 
2354 and following. It was not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when Heolak was slain. This is the poet. It's not Beowulf. It finished with, then that Prince of Rings, I mean 2345, that Prince of Rings, Beowulf, scorned to seek out the far-flung flyer, that is, the dragon, with a full force of men. No, he's not going to take his whole army. It's just going to be Beowulf and a few. And that little passage ends with, he crushed Grindel and his kin in combat that loathsome race. It was not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when he alike was slain. What links the previous passage with the part about Helac? Hand-to-hand -hand combat. How did he kill Grindel? Bare hands. Ripped his arm off. Next passage, it wasn't the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when Helac was slain. Why? Because now we're going to get the allusion to Helac dying in the Frisian raid. This is the second allusion. This guy is named later, okay? but I'm going to mention it now. The reason it's not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combat is because Beowulf kills a guy named Day Raven, who is Helac's killer, with his bare hands. He gets him in a bear hug, look, bear hug and crushes him to death. One thing the Beowulf poet never tells us is that Beowulf ever killed a human being with a sword. He kills Grindel's mother with swords, a sword. He kills giants with a sword. He kills water monsters, sea monsters with a sword. People, bare hands. Why? It's kind of monstrous. When you squeeze the life out of somebody, I mean, you've got to be tremendously strong. You don't have to be tremendously strong to break someone's neck. You do have to know how to do it. But to squeeze them so that their lungs collapse, that's Aglaken level monstrousness, all right? So he talks about Helak. And then we get another reference or allusion to Beowulf's otherness. How do we know? Beowulf was the only person who survived the Frisian raid. The only person, not the only yeet. Okay? Why did he let go on this Frisian raid? We were told earlier, the first reference, to open a feud, to start a feud. Pretty stupid thing to do. Helak dies. All of Helak's men, except for Beowulf, die. And all the Frisians and Hetwara, who are in that battle, die also. One man lives. Last survivor again, Beowulf. And what does he do? He swims away with the suits of armor or suit coats of mail of 30 men dog paddling across the ocean. Totally other, totally different, totally not us. Beowulf is a different kind of being, if you want. Okay? I don't mean magical, mystical, supernatural, just Different paradigm, almost as it were, okay? So, we're told at the end of that passage, line 23, 69 and following, he gets back to the land of the Geats, Helak's dead, Helak's wife and son are still in the Geats land, and his wife, Hig, Helak's wife, offers Beowulf the kingship. Why? Some critics, not many, have suggested, because she's relatively young, and Beowulf is, we don't know, and she looks at Beowulf like, stud. I mean, he's just killed however many men, and he's a monster killer. Marry him. So when she offers him the, what's the phrase? Horde and kingdom, rings and royal throne, royal throne. She's also offering herself. Okay? 
But Beowulf says no. Why not? They have a king. His name's Hardred. He's Helak's son. He's Hig's son. What's the problem with his kingship? He's a boy. So Beowulf agrees to stand behind the throne and flex his muscles. Be the protector. You want to get to Helak? Uh, excuse me. You want to get to Hardred? You got to come through me. And everybody goes, okay. <laughs> we'll back off for a while. But then he comes into his kingship. That is, he gets old enough to become king and rule on his own. How old that is, we don't know. What does that imply, though? Passage of time. We don't know how long Helak remains king when Beowulf comes back from the land of the Danes. We don't know how long Hardred is king. All, all this gets to how old Beowulf is when he fights the dragon. But we are told 2379. Wretched exiles, the sons of Otra, sought him out across the seas. They have rebelled against the Shilving's ruler, the best of all the sea kings who dispense treasure in the Swedish lands, a famous king. That cost him his life. That's what most of this is about. So let me explain this quickly, if I can. Let's start here with Helak, because his death kind of, in a sense, you could say triggers this. Helak goes off on the Frisian raid. While there, he's killed by the Frisian champion. He's actually of the Hugas tribe, or the Hugas, a guy named Dayraven. Dayraven kills Helak, right? Beowulf kills Dayraven. Beowulf comes back. Hardred is too young to be king, so Beowulf kind of king protector. Okay? Hardred grows up, becomes king. So now he's king, right? Um, I'm going to leave this top, this part alone for a second. Okay. So Hardred is now king, and he accepts exiles. These two brothers, Aemon and Aeonils, notice they're Swedes. Okay. Why are they exiles? Because they rebelled against their king. And we're told their king is Onala. They are sons of Othra. Whenever you see genealogies like this, the person on the left is always the oldest. And then next oldest in line. Who should have been king after Anya and Theo? Onala. Onala uh, excuse me, Othra. Othra was king after Anya and Theo. Okay? I'm not talking about when Anya and Theo was killed and all that kind of stuff. Why are they rebelling against their uncle Onala? Who should be king if Othra is dead? Aemon. If King Charles died today, who would be king after him? Prince William. If Prince William died, who would be king after him? Is that the eldest? His eldest son. Who would be king after that one? It wouldn't be that person's brother. It would go back up to Charles's eldest son brother. Don't take that back. It would go back to Charles's eldest, I think it would go to Charles's next eldest son, Harry. Okay? If Prince Andrew, Charles's brother, second in line to Charles, uh, second brother after Charles, if he wanted to become king, what does he have to do? He's got to kill his brother. He's got to kill his nephew William and his children. And he's got to kill his nephew, Harry, and his children. The only way Onola should be king is if these two are dead. Norse sources tell us Onola offed his brother, Kinsley. Okay? There's a reason why these two rebel. He just violated the whole Germanic system. So they run off to Harvard for protection. While there, Onola attacks. Okay, where is he attacking? Where is this? The land of the Geats. Beowulf's not king, Hardred is. Onola kills Hardred. 
Fourfold Germanic ethic then says what? Then demands what? Beowulf should kill Onela. And usually in the tradition, that's immediate. It's like now. Okay? Weston, the name we've not heard before, who is like Onela's right hand man or his most trusted warrior, Weston kills Anmund in this battle in the land of the geese. Okay? So who does that leave? Among this group, Onel is still alive, and Eadils is still alive. Eadils is the one who is the rightful heir to the throne at that point. All right? And we get told in this passage, 2379 through 2390, what happens? Onel kills Hargud, and then he goes back home. He's already been called the best of sea kings among the Swedes, good king. But he lets somebody else rule, because Hergen's dead now. Look at the verb I just used. 2389. And let Beowulf hold the high throne. What does let mean? Verb? Allow. allow? Give permission to? What does it say about the one who allows versus the one who is allowed? Think power relations. The one who allows has what? Has the power. The one who is allowed has less power. What have we just been told? Onala allows Beowulf to become king. That sounds like what? If the United States defeats an enemy in war, think Japan. What did we do after Japan? We allowed the emperor to stay alive. In, in Germany, we allowed Germany to create a government. Immediately after the war, guess who ruled? Someone that we said, hello, you're our puppet. You will do what we tell you to do. When I raised this issue, this question, in 97 on this NSX listserv, I mean the hatred and vitriol that Burn the internet lines was amazing because you would think I had said Beowulf was a fill in the blank of the worst thing you can imagine. What the poet is saying here, or is suggesting, is Beowulf was not the one with power. Onola was. And when we get at the end of that passage, that was a good king. That's the third time in the poem that we get thought was good kinney. I, and quite a few others, don't think that's referring to Beowulf. That's referring to Onola. Onola did what? He took what was coming to him. He got what was his. Good Germanic fashion in that sense. Not in the sense of killing his brother. Violated the law there. But this is part of the, also part of the heroic ethos. He stopped these two, or attempted to stop these two from challenging him. Okay? Next fit. In later days, he did not forget that prince's fall. Who's the he? Beowulf. In later days. Again, that implies lengthy passage of time. He does get vengeance. He just, you know, takes his time. That's not the typical Germanic fashion. Why? Big, huge question. Okay. Why? Why doesn't he get that vengeance immediately? Because he lets Onua go back home. Could Beowulf take Onua? Yeah. <laughs> Easily. But he doesn't. And we don't know why. Okay? That's a problem. So, why does the poet give us all this information? What's at the heart of all of this? I mean, it goes back to this. Beowulf is then going to tell this story. Hrethel, his grandfather, Hefkin, accidentally kills his older brother, Herobald. It's the Germanic myth of Baldur and Hoder. 
Gods are having a party one day. They're shooting stuff at Balder. Why? Because he can't be killed, except for with a sprig of mistletoe. And so people are going up, putting on a blindfold, and shooting stuff at him. And he's like, look, that tickles. And then Loki hands Holder an arrow tipped with mistletoe. He shoots him. Ragnarok starts. Okay? Ragnarok's not alluded to at all in here. Why is this important? Because he has been killed by him. That demands what from him? Revenge. Duty to avenge one's lord or kin. Son of Krevel. So how do you get vengeance against the son who's killed another son? You can't kill him. Kin slain. He dies, Beowulf says, of a broken heart. Why? Talk about your conundrum. Talk about your catch-22. He literally is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. The poet seems, by putting, by jamming all of this stuff together, okay? These two, Anya, Thou, and Hathkin. Hathkin launches a war against the Swedes. And the poet tells us he deprived Anyanthal's wife of her gold. Now, you can read that literally. He took her gold. Or you can read it a little more figuratively. Maybe I'm just a dirty old man. I think he raped her. And so Anyanthal gets his revenge. Hatkin. So, notice. They're all dying. Left and right. If this were a tragedy, you'd have so many bodies piled on the stage you wouldn't be able to walk around. Okay? And then Beowulf fights the dragon. And he fights him alone. Why? Why? Dragon monster killer. Why? The Christian allegors go, it's all because of his pride. And if it is, he's going to end. And I mean, we've talked about these two, Wheelof and Eamon. Very, very, Beowulf dies. There's a messenger. I'm going to send a video for you. There's a messenger who comes and relates a prophecy. What's going to happen? This is going to happen. No longer is Beowulf there protecting the gates. The Swedes are going to attack. Why? Because once Ono is killed, Eadgils is king of the Swedes. Eadgils' brother was killed by Weston, who's the father of Wheelock. Wheelock's going to become the king of the Geats. Why? He's the last remaining person of the Waymunding tribe that Beowulf is also part of. So now you have this feud coming into play. I think I mentioned this the other day. Where are the Geats today? There are Swedes. There are Frisians. Northwest coast of, of Europe off the Netherlands, Germans, no geats. After about the year 700, no historical references. Wiped off the face of the earth. OK, I'm going to put a quiz up for like 1,000 to the end of the poem. That won't be due till Monday. I know Monday's spring break, but anyways. And I'm going to put an exam up. The exam won't be due until the Wednesday after spring break. Remember, no class on Thursday, but, 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 check your email late tomorrow afternoon, early tomorrow night. Very slight chance we will have class on Thursday if I have to put my surgery back, because I probably have a concussion. <laughs> if we're not here, have a good day, have a good weekend, have a good break. Yes. Can I please?